Hello and welcome to St. Peter and Zion's and Churches. Today we celebrate the 23rd Sunday at Pentecost. The Old Testament reading for this, the 23rd Sunday at Pentecost, is from Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you will keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we are not idle when we are with you, nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate, for even when we are with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. This is the word of the Lord, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 21st chapter. While well, some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the day will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. They asked him, Teach when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place. For the end but not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences. There will be tears and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors for name, my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds, and not meditate beforehand how to answer. For I'll give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You have delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake. 
that not a hair of your head will perish. While your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth, and wrath against this people, they will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs of the sun and moon and stars, on the earth distress of nations and perplexity, because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting in fear. And, were, and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud, with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, almighty and ever-living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may live and abide forever in your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. King Herod the Great is famous for ordering the death of the infant and toddler sons of Bethlehem. However, despite his paranoia and cruelty, ancient documents also tell us that before he fell into the paranoid delusions of the last years of his life, he was actually a very capable ruler. The problem that Herod had was that he was a puppet king of the occupying forces of the Roman Empire. And furthermore, he was not even Jewish. This meant that no matter how well he ruled, no matter that he brought prosperity to the land, the people hated him. Herod hoped that improvements to the cities infrastructure would win the hearts of the Israelites. One of these improvements was a massive project that would expand the temple area in Jerusalem. The work on this project began about 20 years before Jesus was born and continued until A.D. 64. This means that every time you read about the temple in the Gospels, it was a temple that was under renovation. Today's gospel begins by telling us that people were discussing the beauty of the temple. We hear some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. I can just imagine the disciples talking about how the new construction made the temple even more magnificent than the last time that they had come. I can imagine them speculating about what things would look like the next time they came to the temple as well. And you can imagine how shocked these disciples were when Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. These words, there will not be left here one stone upon another, indicate that the destruction will be thorough and complete. Jesus' words came true when Rome became frustrated with the constant rebellion of Jerusalem and sent in legions to destroy the city. In AD 70, only six years after the completion of the renovations, 
the armies of Rome destroy the entire city of Jerusalem down to its foundations. Today there is a Muslim mosque on the site where the temple used to be. The stones that once made out the temple now litter the area around the temple mound. Modern archaeologists have left these stones in place as a tribute to the many defenders who lost their lives when these stones were thrown down on them. Of course, today's gospel happened a few decades before this destruction. Disciples had no idea how the Romans would destroy Jerusalem. You can imagine that they were bewildered by Jesus' proclamation of the destruction of the temple. So they asked, Teach, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Jesus used the disciples' question to teach about the end of Jerusalem and the end of time. But first, he gave them some insight into the struggles that his disciples will have while they wait for these enemies. Jesus began his teaching on last things by warning disciples about false prophets. He said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after me. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Jesus knew that there will be deceptive people who will use predictions of the end times to lead people astray. Even today, there are many cults who steal money by predicting the end of time. In some cases, people have even died because they followed these lies. Jesus then told the disciples that the history of the world will continue as it had before, from disaster to disaster. He said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be tears and great signs from heaven. Know that these disasters are merely a short list of the effects that sin has in the world. Then Jesus told of persecution. He said to them, But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I'll give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You'll be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they will put to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Notice here that even family members and friends will betray Christians into persecution. Notice also that God will use this persecution to provide additional opportunities for the disciples to tell what they have heard and seen while they are with Jesus. They will even testify to kings and governors. Persecution will lead to a time of growth for the church. After these teachings, Jesus finally got around to teaching about the destruction of Jerusalem. His teachings are basic common sense. He said, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. This just makes sense. In fact, when the Roman army finally did come to Jerusalem, the Christians were already gone. They got word that the army was coming, and they evacuated the city. Finally, Jesus returned to the topic of the last day. He said to them, 
There is signs and sun and moon and stars. On the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. With these words, Jesus described a fundamental change in the universe. When these things happen, no one will have to inform you that the end of the world has come. It will be apparent to everyone, especially when every person in the entire world will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Most people will be terrified when the end comes. But Jesus has different instructions for his people. He said to them, Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. When the Son of Man comes in clouds of glory, he will come for those whom he redeemed with his suffering and death on the cross. Just as he rose from the dead and ascended, he promised to return to take his people to live with him. The temple had been the place where God made his presence known among his people. Jesus reminded the disciples that the temple was not permanent. The temple, the sacrifices, the festivals, and all the other requirements of the ceremonial law were only preparation for the day when God would dwell among his people as one of them. There were shadows pointing to a future reality that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write. There are shadowed things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The continuous blood and smoke that came from the sacrifices of the sheep, goats, cattle, and birds at the altar in Jerusalem was only a reminder that one day Emmanuel, God with us, would come and God would well with his people. When the Son of God took up our human flesh in order to endure the wrath of God in our place, the temple's days were numbered. When Jesus offered himself up as the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, there was no longer any need for the temple. Its purpose was fulfilled. As Jesus died on the cross to take away the sin, the sun's light faded, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. He who sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins now lives in the hearts of those whom he saves. Since the temple is a place where God dwells, that means the heart of every person he has saved is a temple. How do we know that we are God's temples? The Holy Spirit works through God's word to create faith in the heart. Through baptism, the Word is combined with water, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in that heart. Through the Lord's Supper, the Word is combined with bread and wine, and our mouths receive Jesus Christ himself for strengthening of our faith to endure until he returns. Wherever he makes his presence known to us by these means, that is now his temple. It is appropriate that, as we near the end of the church, we think about the end of our times on this earth. Our end come on the last day. All the signs Jesus mentions in today's gospel have already happened. Nations still rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. We have great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences. The tears and great signs from heaven have already happened. Every time you check the news and hear or read about another disaster or war, it is a reminder that one day Jesus will return to judge the world. He might return before this service is over, or his return could come long after we are all dead. Either way, when the Son of Man comes on the clouds, we shall all straighten up and raise our heads. Because our redemption is coming here. The name of Christ Jesus, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the peace of God is past all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord.
Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For steadfastness in the word of God, which will never pass away, that in these last days we may turn our eyes from the distress of this failing world and lift them to Christ, our help and keeper. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. The ministers of the gospel and those who hear glad, especially all persecuted Christians, that they may be delivered from wicked and evil men, be given a mouth and wisdom to confess Christ boldly, endure faithfully to the end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the homes and businesses of this congregation, that according to the apostolic command, we may remain busy at work, not walk in idleness, see the fruits of our labors, and have hearts directed to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Thanksgiving for those who served our nation through military service, that we may honor their service by using our liberty responsibly our nation and its blessing, for aid in protecting and increasing the benefits we have for those who follow us. Looking always to Christ, from whom true freedom comes, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from fear, as we witness the signs of the times, that we make sober judgment in the face of so many vexing concerns. And for the assurance that, Though the nations rage and the powers press against the church, this is our opportunity to give witness to the word that does not change and to the mercy that is our hope in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable and favorable weather, we ask the Heavenly Father to open the windows of heaven and send bountiful rain on us to revive and to renew the land. Without your care and preservation, all things with him die. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in affliction, that they may endure and hope and raise up their heads as they await the coming of the redemption, Christ Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as the days pass and all things move to their appointed end, Keep us from being complacent. Keep us alert and awake so that when the day comes, we may greet you and rejoice in your eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today.